position. I've seen it happen in church. I've seen it happen to some of the best church people, Christians, committed to Christ people. I know because we have an idea that when you hear the word repent, as we do twice in this passage this morning, that there's going to be some judgment coming and that we might have a tinge of shame. And in fact, we might even feel a little guilt. And as somebody said, a little guilt's a good thing. A lot of guilt's a very, very bad. So I want to talk carefully to you. This is not a softly and tenderly Jesus is calling sermon. This is one of those that we have to be very careful with because there are issues that are really current. In fact, last Sunday, one of the reasons I was absent from Sunday school, I got tied up with a certain church member and he wanted to know why in the world God didn't stop all the stuff that's going on in Ukraine. And I reminded him, I said, Richard, oh, I let it out, didn't I? Don't that wasn't a hard guess, was it? He, hopefully he's watch, going to watch this in Panama because I, I told him before he left, I said, now if you wait, if you could be here next week while I'm going to Panama, well, I'll send it to you in Panama on Facebook. <laughs> so here's the, here's the idea. The idea that somehow when bad things occur, when terrible things occur, when tragedies occur, when wars and, and very evil, bad people do very evil and bad things and people die, we begin to ask questions. We begin to ask questions of ourselves. Can't, uh, we say, uh, I was in a, listen, I, 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 this is no joke. My own mother, my 93-year-old mother said to me the other day, she said, somebody ought to take that guy out. And I said, who are you talking about? And she's referring to food. Don't laugh because you thought it, haven't you? But that, that's a knee-jerk reaction. In fact, I want to share some background a little bit. This is almost like a Sunday school lesson. Do you know the background of this passage, this Luke 13? In fact, leading back into chapter 12 and even chapter 11 and continuing all the way until we get up into the passion stories of his death. This story, according to experts and scholars of all ilk, say that these are sayings or stories that Jesus said perhaps at a dinner in a Pharisee's house. Now, does that make sense? Pharisees are known for wanting answers. By the way, I heard the best line the other day, and maybe as Christians we ought to adopt this, that people are not, people may be looking for answers, but really what they want to hear is our story about Christ living in our life. They don't want platitudes, and they don't, words not attached to actions. They want our story and us to live our story and connect to their story. But this Luke passage takes place after Jesus has been asking questions about the signs. When are these things going to be? When is the Christ going to return? When is the Messiah coming? And I don't know, John, maybe this will be a good way. This is a Wednesday night sitting around on the table in front of the barn kind of discussion. This is a drinking coffee on Friday morning at Starfield Cafe with Bill Fox kind of discussion. This is the kind of discussion you don't really have it in Sunday school. You don't really have it in church. So I'm going to bring it to the church plate this morning and lay it in front of you and say this, that whenever we begin to talk about evil things and bad things happening, in this case, two events, we know little about them. We, we know a little bit about maybe Pilate's nature. Pilate was not a good fellow. Somebody would say, well, was he as bad as Putin? I don't know. But let's say in the weeks leading up to or the months leading up to his putting Jesus on the cross, and he had the power to take him off, so he put him there. 
Pilate does this. There was some, there was some uh, controversy going on in the temple, and basically what he did was he took and killed a bunch of people from Galilee and mixed their blood with the sacrifice of the blood in the temple. That, I, don't, I can't think of a worse thing you could do in church. I mean, uh, burning it down, church burning, maybe coming in and blaspheming in the church, maybe a, 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 having some kind of act uh, that is so awful we can't imagine in the church. And so that's what that said to the Jews. That was awful. Pilate became Putin. So they were killed and the questions asked, are they bad sinners because... God obviously judged them because they obviously got killed and all the other people in the temple didn't get killed. None of you have ever had that thought when something bad happened that somebody might have deserved it, had you? Ooh, it got really quiet. <laughs> yes, we have. Jesus' own disciples have had that thought. Put yourself in their shoes. Do you remember the boy that was born blind and he got healed and his parents were asked? And the disciples came to Jesus and said, wait a minute, did his parents sin or did he sin? We, we may not admit it, but when bad things happen, we start looking for really quick, snippy little answers. Well, it was those bad people. It was that bad leader. So then there's another question asked, not, not the act of some evil leader or tyrant, but then this tower falls down and John, I don't know who the engineer was for that event or what that was about or whether it was poor construction, but it fell down and it killed 18 people. Jesus it must have known about it. He gives the number. And the same question is asked. Were they bad because it, it didn't fall on anybody else? It just fell on those 18 people. And if you don't think this is a common theme in human beings, go all the way back to Job. Does anybody remember what Job's friend said to him when all that bad stuff happened? I know James Zitta does. James, what did they say to him? What did they say? I don't remember the words, but they basically said he was bad. He was bad. He must have done what? This happened to you because why? Say it, anybody. Job, you did this because what? He's a sinner. He's a sinner. Boy, you need friends like that when you get tragedies, don't you? <laughs> we really need people to love us when that happens. But you see, Jesus' disciples are caught up in this dining room kind of conversation, after dinner kind of conversation. You know the kind of conversations we have but won't really have in church. So this is a non-church, but it really is an important theological conversation. Because whether we admit it or not, we all think it. If something bad happens, there must be some kind of reason. There's got to be. It can't be that children are being bombed and killed, as Richard said last week in the parking lot. It can't be that that's somehow God will, can it? It can't be that they're bad people and the Russians are good people. It can't be that some Ukrainian children are killed in a maternity hospital and others are walking around healthy. It can't be that, that random. It just can't be. Now I want to say this. Jesus could have taken this opportunity to say, let me explain to you how the universe works. Could have done that. He could have said, let me lay out for you disciples and Pharisees and others sitting around on the floor reclining, eating at table, and let I, we can, I can explain to you the will of God and how it works. Can I say something? This is not a passage about the will of God. We may want it to be that. We may want those kind of answers. I've shared this before, and some of you may not have heard it. Some of you new may not. My brother was uh, hit by a drunk driver, a lawyer of all things, son of a judge in North Carolina in the late 50s, hit, knocked up on the curb, lived four days, and died four days later. My dad's namesake, it had a tremendous impact on my family and how it welded itself. It had a tremendous impact on, on the rest of us as children, how we responded to God in a very positive way. But I'll never forget a Presbyterian minister came to the house. My parents were Methodist, and, but he was the pastor of the woman next door. And I will say this, she was caring. She, she wasn't sure that 
my parents went to church enough. My dad was in the, some kind of business where a lot of times he was traveling on Sunday. And so he, she invited her pastor to come. And I heard this story. I, I wasn't present or maybe I was in the room. Don't remember it. But I remember hearing this from my dad for years, and not just years, decades later. Do you know what the pastor said to my dad sitting in his living room four days or five days after he buried his oldest child? Can anybody guess what he said? God's will. Ouch. Now, he didn't say that Mac died because Mac was bad. Thank goodness he didn't say that. I think he'd have been a dead Presbyterian preacher. <laughs> but, but you see, we want answers, and sometimes we are so anxious to comfort people in their tragedies that we want to give answers. And can I say this? Sometimes that's just not our role. It's not our lane. It's not our place. Now, Richard specifically asked in the parking lot last week, why didn't somebody do something about that? And I wanted to say, well, we're praying, but that sounded a little pat, didn't it? And I said, well, there are people. And I said, Richard, I said, can I remind you that this happened in Cambodia and that this has happened in other places and it happened in Iraq and it's happened in other places and it happened with us in Vietnam and it's happened in other places and it happened in World War II and it's happening over and over and over again. We, we do just kind of hear about it because the news is covering it, by the way, 24-7. But as my good friend, the chaplain at 9-11 said, there are tragedies happening every single day in the life of somebody. There are unexplained towers. There are things that are falling down in your life. Sometimes there are things falling on you, and it feels that heavy, doesn't it? So what do we do when bad things happen to unsuspecting people? First of all, it'll lead us it will probably lead us down that road of well, what happened and why did it happen and am I bad or am I good or if it didn't happen to me, am I better than them? Are we better than they? Where it should take us is here. It should remind us of the fragility and the preciousness of life itself. Let me say that again. When tragedy occurs, it should remind us of how sudden and how fragile and how just what is it the, the proverb said? Is it, it comes like a, like the wind and it's gone. That's it. And somebody would say, well, "Is that any com comfort for that?" When 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 Pilate killed those Galileans and mixed the blood of their sacrifices, it, it, is it is it a deed that that we can look at and say, "Wow, goodness, that's horrible." Is the Ukrainian war like in, unlike any other tragedy? And we would say, "Well." It's different in that it's happening to the Ukrainians, but it's not any different. People are dying. Lives are being snuffed out. Evil is being done in the name of power. But it ought to lead us. Let's make Ukraine our pilot tyrant deal. And then let's make any accident that's ever happened to you, any circumstance in life that's ever had something fall on you, and let's make that the second one. And it ought to remind us of the, of the fragility and of the preciousness and the gift that is life itself. And that gift is from God. It is. Jesus says, when they're asked the question, well, what about this? Well, that Jesus implies, get this, that they're, it, they're, they did nothing wrong that we know of and that nothing particular about their life caused their demise. It happened. Now that's interesting. Jesus, who knows everything except when the end is going to be, could have said, I could explain this to you. As I said earlier, he could have said, I can give you some hints and clues, and I could tease you. I can give you a chart. I can put it on the wall. I want to be careful to uh, demean here. I can go on television and tell you there's an exact reason why that hurricane hit New Orleans. is because those people in New Orleans are so dang bad. Right? I knew some of those people in New Orleans and I knew some of them that got run out of their churches and their ministries. They weren't bad people. 
It's interesting. Jesus resists the temptation to, to say anything other than this. They died. No. They didn't die because they were more evil than the other people in Jerusalem. No, they didn't die because they were more evil than the other Galileans who got killed by Pilate. No, they died. So when bad things happen to unsuspecting people, and including when those unsuspecting people are us, it'll, it allows us to do two things. The first thing is to simply say that life is a gift and it is fragile and we need to protect it in all cases and we need to honor it and we need to love it and we need to care for it and we need to not ever, ever judge it prematurely. That's why Jesus tells this parable. You see, we read this parable and think, God is, God is the coming down. He's still, no, no, no. I got a new interpretation on this just today. God is the gardener. God said, the gardener says, wait a minute. Don't cut it down. Let me, let me fertilize it. Let me let it grow. Let me let it do all that. So here's the second aspect of this is that the opportunity in tragedy is the opportunity to repent. Now you're saying, what? You said these people weren't bad. You said they weren't evil. No, no. Here's the definition of repent. Let me, let me, read, a, let me read a story. How many of you know who Alfred Nobel was? Anybody know who Nobel was? Nobel did two things important. One, he gave, he gave money and endowed the Nobel Peace Prize. Does anybody know what he did before he endowed, how he made his money? Does anybody know? He did what, John? Dynamite. He invented dynamite. He invented dynamite, and then he gave money for the Nobel Peace Prize. He, are y'all? He invented dynamite, and then he gave money for. Was there some repentance going on? Was there a change in thinking, a change in life? Here, here's the story on that. I love this. I got this straight out of a book, and I thought I've never heard this before. But this is what it says. In 1867, there was an obituary in the paper in his hometown, and it. And here's what it said. It said something like this. It said, uh, Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, died yesterday and devised a way for more people to be killed in a war than it ever had before. He died a very rich man. The only problem was his brother had died and they had mixed up the names. Nobel said this. It had a profound effect. He realized he didn't want to be known primarily as the person who developed the most effective killing machine of his generation and amassed a fortune doing it. Sounds more like the villain to a story than the protagonist, right? So here's what he did. He founded the Nobel Prize. Nobel said when he did it, he said, every man ought to have the chance to correct his epitaph in midstream and write a new one. Amen? Amen. Do we believe in that in the church? Do you know what that's called? It's called repentance. It's called turning around. I heard this definition. It's such a wonderful definition of that. Is that, that we have, most of us take the old Hebrew word for repentance. You know, it's a word used in the Old Testament to express feeling. And uh, 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 the old word, uh, I love that prayer. If you remember the movie Gone with the Wind when Scarlett and her sisters and mom and daddy are kneeling in their Catholic worship in their home. And they're, they're talking about all those grievous sins that they most grievously have committed and on and on. That's our idea. Our idea of repentance is this feeling of great remorse. That's an Old Testament idea. Do you know what the word Jesus used means? To turn back home. To turn around. To recognize the difference between our ways and the ways God intended for us and find that we have drifted off course and out of line with his divine plans. That's what it means. So when Jesus said these tragedies occur, and guess what? If you don't get rid of your sins, you don't clean up your act, and you don't act right, and you don't put on a good suit of clothes and show up for church next Sunday, you're going to end up like the Galileans' blood mixed in the temple, and you're going to end up like the people that the tower fell on. No, that here's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, but he said, why don't you live your life in such a way that you're on the right track with God, the track God intended, the purpose and the plan for his life. He, By the way, you know who he's saying this to? His disciples. 
his own disciples a few weeks before his own crucifixion and resurrection still weren't on track. They still hadn't repented. They still didn't understand. You remember how many times Jesus used this phrase, oh, slow and foolish to believe. No, we need to repent in the same way that Alfred Nobel repented. We need to change the direction of our life and take what gifts God has given us and use them for his purposes and for his will for our lives. Gordon MacDonald, the theologian from Boston, said this way, repentance is not basically a religious word. Guess what? It comes from the culture and the Aramaic where people were essentially nomadic. And they lived in a world where there were no maps or GPS or street signs. It was easy to get lost walking in the desert, McDonald says. You become aware that the countryside is strange. You finally say to yourself, I'm going in the wrong direction. And the first act of repentance is to recognize you're in the wrong place. The second act of repentance is to go in an alternate direction. Wow. They wanted answers about the will of God and the mysteries of the universe. And Jesus said, before you can get all that, here's what you need to do. You need to turn around and start back in the direction God intended for you. And follow his plan. Wow. Eugene Peterson said this, you repent only when you turn around and go back toward God. It doesn't make a difference how you feel. You can have the feeling of remorse or guilt or you don't have to have any feeling at all. What's essential is that you do it. We talked about that Lent was a season of self-reflection, looking at ourselves. And I know of no better time to look at ourselves and look at the world around us in the midst of tragedies, in the midst of terrible, evil things and ask ourselves this question. Am I, am I headed in the direction that God wants me to head in? Am I on the path that he would have me to go? Repentance. You want answers about tragedies? Then look at where you are. If the land seems unfamiliar, if it seems like a land in which you're judging people for what they're doing and not looking at your own heart, then maybe you need to turn in a different direction. If you are trying to figure out nitpicking answers so that you've got the answer and you've got the truth and you've got it and you can point it at people and say, see, I told you they were bad people, those Galileans. See, I can told you those people that live over in Green Oaks were bad people. See, I can tell you that church over at Mediview and doing the right thing. You see, all them, they. Repentance begins with the inward turn. <laughs> So that there can be an outward, as John Wesley said, an invisible sign of an inward spiritual grace. So what do we do when things fall on us? <laughs> when our lives collapse around us? When real, can I say this? I'll be careful how I say this. When real tragedy occurs, the unexplained, the unknown, the inexplicable. Old Richard was right to ask the question. Somebody ought to do something. He was right to ask the question, what is all this about? And then the answer for Richard and for you and for me, and really for all of us who are followers of Christ, is to ask, am I on the path that God has called me to be on? Am I, am I traveling that trail? Now, let me say this. If having the answers to why bad things happen is where you want to go, then I commend you to scripture and prayer. And I will say this to you, you'll spend an awful lot of, of your time. And can I say that maybe a lot of time unnecessarily spent doing that. But if your purpose is to conform to the image of Christ and to walk in his ways and to follow him in his paths and to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, then it might be better to begin to look at the idea of repenting, turning changing and that was supper table talk to Jesus and his disciples and to those who were listening 
I wish I could tell you that that old Presbyterian minister was right or wrong about what he said. Probably from a pastoral care standpoint, he wasn't, he was way off the mark. But maybe he was searching for something and maybe he was trying to offer comfort. I'm sure he was. But today, if you're looking for answers to Ukraine and you're looking for answers to tragedies in your own life, and maybe they're all long past tragedy. Maybe there's some you've been carrying around for years. Maybe there are things that happened to you when you were a child or a teenager or a young adult. Maybe there are things that happened to you last week. I will say this to you. Christ calls you to turn in his direction. And Softly and tenderly, he is calling to look upon his face and to find him. And in doing that, to find peace. Let us pray. Lord, we'd rather have concrete answers to troubles, to tragedies, and Lord, what you really are calling us to do is to trust you for our direction, for our purpose. Lord, I suspect that if you really, if we really begin to repent, that we'll really begin to pray and earnestly for peace in Ukraine. We'll earnestly begin to pray, to pray for those who are inflicting the pain and the conflict. That we'll really get involved where we can and when we can in helping those who are suffering. And Lord, we won't just do that in Ukraine, but that will become a lifestyle. That will become a direction. It won't just be whenever there's some major tragedy that hits the CNN 24-7, but it'll be whenever the Spirit of God calls us to be compassionate and caring and loving. Lord, may we not be people looking to judge or to get come up with answers, but may we be people seeking a direction and finding that in you. For we ask this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Remind you of Sunday school following worship and uh, of course on the 24th Thursday the Young Life folks will be here. Of course other things are going on. The egg hunt's going on. There are ways you can help. Some of you have already jumped up and volunteered or, or been, been pinholed and you are doing some things. One of the things you might do in that, just thinking out loud, is begin to invite people. Invite people without judging. Say, you know people that have children and, and maybe, maybe they already have a church. Maybe they don't. Invite them to come that on that uh, Friday afternoon of the 15th and be with us. Let's take time as we stand and sing. Number three, 438, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. <laughs>
prayer for you today is that whatever has fallen on you in the past or what feels heavy upon your life now, what questions you may have about the tragedies and the terrors and the evil of the world, may God give you direction and give you peace and give you purpose in serving and offering the gifts of life and eternal life to those around you. Go in that same peace. Go in the knowledge that he's present with you always, even in tragedy. And do this in Jesus' name.